the reason we're all here. is to welcome our guest today and look forward to 45 minutes, 50 minutes of enlightenment. Christine Holgate has been called the rock star of Australian business. Not surprising when you look at her record of achievement as the head of the dynamic vitamin family owned company Blackmores. If you'd bought shares when Christine became the chief executive at Blackmores not quite 10 years ago, you wouldn't be here today you'd be living in the south of France. She took the Blackmore shares from $20 to a peak of $220, from $20 to $220. Now, I suspect that peak was probably unsustainable, but uh, it's still massively higher than it was when she arrived. Now, some of Christine's stories about her time at Blackmore's and the insights to her management style are fascinating, as you're about to hear. The founder of Blackmore's, Marcus Blackmore, who hired her, described himself as a capitalist with socialist tendencies and Christine as a socialist with capitalist tendencies. She's refined that a little bit, as I said earlier, to free market socialist and we might explore what that means shortly. Recognising the potential of China and coming up with a strategy to exploit that potential was a big part of the key to Christine Holgate's resounding success at Blackmore's and may well be the key to the future for the extremely disruption challenged Australia Post where she is now the group CEO and managing director. Is there a major company in Australia that has been and will be disrupted as much as Australia Post in the internet age where telegrams can only be found in museums and nobody writes letters anymore? With an army of 30,000 posties on the payroll that's quite a challenge. And I was telling Christine just a few minutes ago that um, I actually had to post a letter a few weeks ago and when I went to the drawer to pull out the stamp to put on it, I honestly didn't know whether the price of the stamp was still valid. And we had to check and of course it wasn't. And that wasn't because the price of the stamps goes up a lot, it was because it was a very, very, very long time since I'd last posted a letter. Incidentally, Christine's also on the board of the Collingwood Football Club and was the first woman to be named CEO of the Year by the CEO magazine. Would you please welcome Christine Holgate. Oh dear, it's all gone quiet. <laughs> Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Thank you for making me feel so welcome here today. It's a little bit intimidating, you know, standing up here. Before I speak, can I acknowledge um, my partners in crime? Um, Bruce McIver, who's one of our board members. Bruce, thank you for coming. Um, Mark Gardy, Michelle, Paula Farrell from our communications teams, and many other people, because all organizations are really a team, you know. So one person may stand up here, but we're a team, and thank you. Well, where do I start? Um, I met Ray last year when Marcus, um, when Marcus, my last chairman, got welcomed into the Hall of Fame here in Brisbane. And after a night of celebrating, Ray turned around and said to me, you know, I run this program. Would you come along? It's just a few friendly people. They'd love to hear from you. Mmm, Ray. <laughs> And um, anyway, it wasn't long after I joined Australia Post, the invite came. And I had a bit of initial hesitation, I'll be quite frank with you. And so I didn't respond and they kept chasing me. And it wasn't because I don't respect your program, I sincerely do and I really believe it is knowledge that separates us, not our surnames or how wealthy we are. But it was because I don't think I'm a great role model you know, I come from a dysfunctional background and um, I'm not sure that's the best thing to speak at such an amazing event with Queensland University. And secondly, not everything in my life has gone smooth and, um, you know, it can be sometimes a bit emotional for me and it's very, very personal. However, I hold in my heart some values, what I believe in, and one of those is giving back. And I was extremely fortunate that somebody gave back to me early on in my life. And so today is actually, this one's for her. 
I was asked by Ray not to give a talk about um, what the share price is. <laughs> not to share with you charts or anything else, but to talk about who I am as a person and what shaped me as a leader. So my talk with you today, I hope to be able to do that and you to get a sense of what motivates me and how I want to contribute to Australia and Australia Post. I grew up in the northwest of England, if you haven't quite worked out yet from my northern English accent. Um, one of five children from Beryl and Eric and one of three daughters. I was number four, which really meant nowhere. Um, <laughs> I grew up in a village which for over a thousand years our family is registered in. Our farm was in the Doomsday Book, so I hope you're getting the picture. Midsummer's murders would have nothing on Kingsley. <laughs> My mum raised her children and she fostered plenty more of us installing in her strict values, respecting everybody, having a charitable heart, and that you're never too important. But my father was the complete opposite. He was a true entrepreneur. Every night you came home, he had a different venture going on. It was actually quite exo exotic at times, but my father believed you should never be given anything and that you should always earn it. So he refused to give us any pocket money. The unfortunate thing with my father was that we clashed. I'm so emotional. <laughs> my dad did not want a daughter with opinions. In fairness to him, I shaved my hair off, I pierced my nose. <laughs> I, <laughs> I caused the demonstration his best mate ran the local hunt, and I thought, not on my mother's farm. <laughs> so he may have had a few, a few reasons for concern. But I was a rebel without, without a cause, trapped in a village I didn't want to be in, longing to be at the other side of the world. It really wasn't all my fault. The day after leaving school, he left me an ultimatum delivered by my mother a suitcase in the hallway saying, live by my rules or you're out. He was convinced I should marry Andrew Pemberton, <laughs> the farmer next door, and only because he, he flew pigeons and he wanted to get the, you know, a clear run <laughs> over his fields. <laughs> Nothing to do with me. And my mother, who's probably the nicest woman in the world, was the one to deliver me the news. You know, it's a defining moment for me, and I knew at that moment this was my chance. I grabbed hold of the suitcase and started to negotiate with my mother. Would she buy me a ticket to Manchester Railway Station? How much money would my dad give me to go away? So I quit with 210 pounds and, and a taxi to Manchester. And my mother packed two tea towels, because I was a good northern girl. Um, off I started into a journey where I didn't know. It wasn't great. It was actually pretty hard at times. But I was actually really lucky because, you know, I can talk. <laughs> I'm sure my team have found that out. And um, I talked my way into a bed sit, you know, because I arrived in London and reality struck. It was 10 o'clock at night, I had nowhere to live, and only by this stage, 190 pounds left after the train fare. Anyway, I slept that night in Euston Railway Station, and the next day, I found myself a bed sit. It was pretty miserable. But I got myself a job as a waitress in a burger bar. I'm a vegetarian. The wages were 50 cents, 50 pence, I should say, 50 pence an hour. And my rent was 45 pound a week. So it doesn't take long to work out. I had to work 90 hours to pay the rent. And I didn't know anybody. So very soon I had three jobs on the go and 120 hour working weeks. I now find it hard when people come to me and say, I think I'm working too hard. <laughs> this is just something inside me <laughs> that remembers those days. But you know, it was actually 
of those some awful things did happen in that period, it was also very good for me because I learned what it was like to be an outsider. I learned what it was like to have nothing and to be estranged from your own family. Really, the only night I ever had off was a Sunday and out of sheer loneliness, I went to the local church and I walked in for evening song. This old lady came over and accosted me. I'm pretty sure she thought I was there to rob the silver and I probably should have done <laughs> because by this stage I was so poor I'd broken into the electric meter and had the same 50 pence going round and round. But something happened that night with this old lady who was 60 years older than me and spent her life as a cleaner at the BBC. She lived in community housing. She was on the third floor in a block, which meant she got all the road traffic. But she looked beyond my pink, frizzled wisps of hair, my starved look, and my nose ring. And she saw somebody else. And she started a magical friendship, and she gave me a right to believe, a right to fight, a right to argue, a right to campaign, and a right to be who I wanted to be. She's the most amazing. Everything I have is down to her. Her name was Flo. <laughs> Flo actually was not anybody who showed any love or emotion. And if she was with me now, she'd be slapping me, <laughs> quite honestly. She was pretty hard at times. She was one of ten children who'd grown up with an alcoholic father. Her mother had died in childbirth and she ended up bringing up those siblings and she often felt the other side of her father's hand late in a Saturday evening. And when she saw me, I think she sort of adopted me, almost like the stray dog on the doorstep. But she kept telling me, you can't be a waitress. You can't have my life. You owe it to me and to all other women who have no choices. You have to go to college and you have to study and you're going to have to listen. Mm. So with her help, she actually blackmailed somebody to get me into business school. There was only one problem and that problem was is that I wasn't entitled to get a grant. So I had no way of paying my fees we sort of negotiated with the college that they would let me have free scholarship, but um, I had to find a way to live. Finding a way to live in London, can I tell you, when you don't know anybody and you're 18 years of age, is not exactly easy. But we worked out that we trusted each other because we met each other in a church. So we created a marketing campaign and we worked out has anybody lived in London here? You'll know that they have, you remember the old A to Z that you had with every road map? So we, we got the A to Z out. We worked out where every, I guess you look at Google Maps these days, where every religious institution was. And so off we went on her free bus pass, hoping no one caught me. And we walked into every, whether it was the, um, the synagogue, the Greek Orthodox, it didn't matter. Inside we put a postcard. Student requires work to see her way through college. And then what we did is that Flo took in that work with me and she ran the book. And we hired all the other students at college for £2.50 an hour. We kept 50 pence and we started our business. We later sold that business. And you know what? I'm so proud to say that by the end of our first year together, we had enough money to pay for a deposit on my first home. And I was out in my bed sit. <laughs> was pretty grotty. <laughs> anyway, life goes on. You know, one of those things that happened in that period of time of going to college, I started to realize that people were judging me by the qualifications I had, and not only by my northern accent. And so the education was really important. And with Flo's support, I continue, I got a proper job in the end, at the end of three years. But with her support and encouragement, I applied for every scholarship going. I went on to do three postgraduate degrees, an MBA. I studied Chinese for three years, all on someone else's money. 
all of those things enabled me to have an incredible opportunity to be able to go into industry and have a career. And I feel extremely privileged that I was given an opportunity to set up for the first time in competition to BT, a business which we took from nothing to 250 million in just three years. And several years later, when I was at Cable and Wireless, I was asked to go back and to sell it for seven billion pounds. An opportunity to actually go to the White House and meet Bill Clinton, to go and meet Fidel Castro. And I am a socialist in my heart, but I just happen to believe that we need to have free trade and industry. And so I am completely always arguing with myself. But you know, I really learned then that there's so much we can gain from listening from others. What drives them? What motivates them? Why did they do that? You don't have to be like them. But you know, there is probably no better education than listening to the journeys of others to work out who you are as a person. In 2003, I, um, I moved to Australia and post the financial restructuring of a business that I was in, I was really attracted to this idea of meritocracy. I have a deep love of sport and the better weather that you have here. But I came here to work for Telstra and that was pretty miserable too. And I found myself, you know, very quickly not belonging or fitting in again. I had the very good fortune to meet a Jesuit priest. He was somebody who campaigned for human rights and I immediately found myself beginning of a family. I also met Eddie Maguire and I do realize in the home of NRL here in Queensland, I may not have too many fellow Collingwood supporters. But Collingwood, Eddie invited me to a game and the board of Collingwood, again, just like Flo, looked beyond my pommy accent and my complete lack of understanding for any AFL rules. I just know today there are no rules. <laughs> so, but then I was innocent. But that board welcomed me in, and so did the club of Collingwood. And just like Flo, they gave me a reason to believe and a sense of belonging. They made Australia home. So I'm incredibly proud now to be able to give back to that club. A club, when I was nobody, gave me everything. I am a firm believer that none of us are any better than anybody else. And to be part of an institution that supports every night 300 homeless people being fed and 200 homeless people having shelter is an amazing feeling. And that is Collingwood Football Club. You may be surprised. <laughs> but in 2008, I found I really faced my biggest challenge. And that was my sister, Elizabeth. Because before all of my rebel behavior, Elizabeth was two years older, but looked 10 years younger. And right through school, I always felt she was my little sister. She was the complete opposite to me. She never answered back. She never dyed her hair. She never got drunk, she never got threw out. Um, she got married to the boy in the village, she had two children, and she had a home in our, in our village too. She was perfect. <laughs> but I loved her. She had two kids, Eddie and Brian. But on the birth of Eddie, they diagnosed her with cancer, and it was already far gone. On Eddie's second birthday, which very shortly is her 10th anniversary, Elizabeth died. I can't begin to say how I felt. Anger, hate, frustration. I couldn't change it. I was used to arguing, but I couldn't change it. Elizabeth, wrote me a letter. She told me she had. Do you know, it was just a page from a pad. I was so disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> I was expecting some big emotional note. It said, promise me, one, you dress me for the funeral, um, for the coffin. Two, you will always be a part of my boys' lives. Love, Liz. 
This morning I spoke to my boys and they're well and I love them deeply. I found Elizabeth's death incredibly hard, but it taught me some harsh realities. You know life's not perfect. Lots of crap happens. It doesn't matter what goes wrong. It matters how you get up again and fight back. It matters what you take from it and what you learn from it. And you know, in business life, it actually provides a very useful reflection. Because often at work, when people come in with problems, I said, has anyone died? No, well, get on with it. <laughs> on the day I returned home from Australia, after Elizabeth's funeral, I received a call from the headhunter who had recruited me in. And he asked me to meet Marcus Blackmore. He was the chair of the natural health company Blackmore's. He was looking for a CEO. He'd actually asked me to meet him several times and I'd always said no. And this time he said he's doing research into vitamin D, it prevents cancer. So he clearly worked out the line and, um, and I said yes. And that afternoon, actually, I went to meet Marcus for a cup of tea. However, when I walked in, the whole board was sitting there. <laughs> it was an interesting moment. Marcus did not want to meet me either, by the way. What, some girl from England from Telstra who's going to come and run my company? I don't think so. But I suspect within minutes, both Marcus and I formed a bond. He asked me, why should he give me the keys to his bank account? And I challenged him, why should I give you the keys to my career? You know, in every negotiation there is two sides. Never is one more important than the other. I was asked, how would I be like working for this very domineering male, as Ray can vouch he is? I said after six months, I couldn't be able to work for him. I'd work with him, but he'd have to work for me. He tore a piece of paper, wrote down his mobile number, and said, I want to work for you. Call me. And that was the beginning of an amazing partnership. Together, we rebuilt the team of, of Blackmores. And actually, our share price was $10.70 the day I joined. I'm not counting. But you know, to be part of a team, when you've really got strong purpose, you know, we had such strong values. That's why we, that's how we interviewed people. And we challenged ourselves. And we fired people, even the best performers, if we felt they didn't live by our rules. But we created a united team. And that team, I'm really pleased to say, went on to launch in 17 countries. We won numerous awards. Our employee engagement was 94%, which is pretty high, you know. And uh, we won lots of awards for things that we believed in, like sustainability and being kind to the environment. And I can honestly say we are both advocates. I like to challenge for trade and prosperity. I believe it is very important for the future of this country and for the future of jobs. And in terms of making sure that we had the rules for Blackmores to be able to trade in Asia, I became very close to what was happening in free trade agreements. And so Julie Bishop, when she formed a new Australian ASEAN Council to look at trade and cultural policy, she called me and asked me, would I possibly consider doing it? Was she kidding? Do you know how long it took to say yes? It was a dream come true. And I can honestly say that those nine years with Marcus were some of the happiest in my entire life. I love my job. I love that company. So why did you leave? That's always the question that I get. Well, you know, Marcus, like my mother, had installed in me a deep set of values about the importance of social contribution. And I guess that's at the very heart of me. You know, when I first got the phone call would I go in and meet with them, I actually spoke to Marcus first because we have a very strong relationship of trust. He said, I think it would be an honor but don't get disappointed when they don't give you the job. And right until the very last interview, Marcus actually coached and mentored me through the process. He wasn't too chuffed in the end, though, <laughs> as some of you may have seen in the papers. So what was it about Australia Post? Why, why was I giving up my dream job? Well, 
As I started to research Australia Post, I visited 10 international postal operators and 117 postal post offices before I joined the company. I found these amazing people, people like Mario, who's sitting down here on our table with us today from our mail center, people who've given 30 years of their life to actually deliver our mail, to keep communities alive, people who mortgage their homes to run a post office and have our brand, and how important it was, particularly in rural communities, for them to have a post office. I could see a campaign, a movement beginning. I wanted to save the postie. I fell in love with the job and with the challenge. You know, and when the decision came out, I've, I had a lot of feedback. <laughs> Some of that feedback was from my feminist friends who said, why on earth did you take a job? A half the salary of your predecessor, you've let us all down. Why have you walked away when you were paid so much more and left all these options? It's interesting, isn't it, how people value things? Perhaps being the first ever woman to run Australia's oldest organisation, biggest retail network, and actually indirectly, indirectly largest employer, I could make a bigger stand for women, not just my salary. It never crossed my mind. John Stanhope, our chairman, could have offered me a dollar and I would have taken that job. And Bruce McIver knows that when the contract was given to me, the only change I asked for was to be on Collingwood's board, to be noted in my contract. I didn't query, if that's what they want to pay me, they can pay it me. Because I will never measure myself on that job, I will measure myself on helping our organisation return to sustainable and profitable growth and by the satisfaction of our customers. And clearly, we have a bit of work to do. Australia Post profits are scarily low, as Bruce could also tell you. And our revenues have not really grown for several years. If we do not fundamentally change this organisation, thousands of people will lose their jobs. Thousands. A lot of those people live in small towns where they're unlikely to work again. Post offices will close. Some of you living in beautiful Brisbane may not be too concerned with that. But the banks have long gone, and we are actually the only access point for them getting any kind of financial support. The research back from our customers is clear. We must stand up, start focusing on customers, protect the post offices, improve our service, and get on building a business again. And I don't have any doubt that that's what the team and I will get focused on and do. And so how will we do it? Well, we will do just that. We will improve tracking. We will make our licensed post offices sustainable again, and we will invest in them. We will put our people at the very heart of our business and recognize their contribution. And anyone who wears our brand will be considered ours. But most of all, a surprise for some of you in this room is that Australia Post is probably the most dangerous job in the country. We lose more people every year delivering your parcels than anybody else. Can you believe that? More people than working in the army. And so I have a strong commitment towards the well-being and safety of my people, and that will be my first priority. Ladies and gentlemen, this last weekend, I don't know if any of you saw it in the news, but we had the most incredible thing go on here in Australia. All 10 countries of ASEAN, in fact, nine heads of country, 10 heads of country, including Malcolm and Philippines sent their foreign minister, came to Australia. And Malcolm Turnbull asked me to be the business lead when he was the lead for the government. I can't begin to tell you what an amazing moment it was for me when I spoke to Aung San Suu Kyi about human rights issues. I could talk to Jokowi about the importance of food and the importance of exports and Aussie farmers being able to sell their products in Indonesia. 
And Saturday night, after several days of this, and pretty late on, I was sitting in the back of a car coming home, and I couldn't help but reflect about the girl who slept the night in Euston Station. And I thought to myself, knowing that Ray was on my back to come here today and give you a speech, and knowing I really didn't want to come and be emotional with you, but what would I say to myself if I was in that moment again now? So I would say to you, I have a few points I would think I would like to say to myself. You know, simple acts of kindness can move and make an incredible difference, and we can all do them. That old lady had nothing, but she believed in me, and her belief gave me the right to believe in me. So all of us in this room can do that for someone else. We can open our hearts and just support one other person. What an amazing place this world could be. Be open to new ideas and learning, and learning from others, because you never know where this will lead to. Who would have ever thought that an old lady of 78 living in a council block was going to be my mentor and the person who would change my life? Surround yourself and hire people who are passionate and share your values. Passion and purpose can kill skills any day. Forgive me, I know this is a university program. <laughs> but I just believe it in my heart. Because it's the thing that gets you up and gets you to the top of the mountain, even when you broke your ankle. Things go wrong, and you will survive. They will hurt you, but hurting is not bad. It's authenticity. It's knowing yourself. It's caring. It's what you allow other people to do. What does not break you will make you stronger. If you are determined, you can achieve your dreams. After all, how could this girl with a pink shaved head and a nose ring get to be the person representing Australia, arguing for trade and human rights? So if I can do it, just imagine what everybody in this room can do. Aung San Suu Kyi is famous for saying something, and its words, I think, particularly relate to females. So forgive me when I say this, but I believe that females are often our own worst critics. It is not men who hold us back, but it is often ourselves. And our words are, the only real prison is fear. The only real freedom is freedom from fear. It is us who holds us back break out of our fear, even me today standing on the stage, you know, and just let it go. And you too, can, you too can achieve what you may want to do. Finally, if I thought about just one word that I thought was so important to leadership and has had such a, an incredible impact in my life, it's the word belief. Belief in others, and belief in yourself. That's what Marcus Blackmore did with me. I had no experience of natural health. I'd never run a publicly listed company. But in those few moments of meeting me, he believed in me and gave me the keys to his bank account. That old lady believed in me. And I hope by now, I start to believe in others and pass back to people all the things that they have given to me. Thank you sincerely for listening to me today. I want you to know I give you and Australia my absolute commitment that my team and I will do everything that we can to return the incredible, incredible honour to leave such an amazing organisation as Australia Post. Thank you. That's a first. Um, I've got about two hours of questions scribbled on this bit of paper, and that was just the beginning. I'll go straight to the, to the biggest question of all. Whatever happened to Andrew Pemberton? <laughs> I haven't, oh, and, oh. 
He Enough got, said. He got, no, he got married. Actually, can I tell you from his story? What, what would life be like for you now if you it's were actually, Mrs Pemberton? <laughs> it's actually, well, life moves on, doesn't it? My mum's old now, so I bought her a, co a cottage in the village. But the cottage now backs onto Andrew Pemberton's farm. <laughs> 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 and for a long time, Andrew Pemberton kept coming up and down with his tractor. He never got married. My dad said I broke his heart. <laughs> <laughs> Could have been other reasons. So... So much raw emotion today, and I know this isn't the first time, um, but, but such a determination and, and a deliberateness, knowing that that's the way it's going to be, to push through. Whereas uh, we all know that it is, that it is one, of the, one of the negatives for women in the workforce not just in the workforce, that to show emotion is immediately seized on by some as a sign of weakness. Oh, she's emotional. It's important to you to be that way, isn't it? Why? Yeah, I, th I think that's nonsense. Everybody's emotional. You know, what happens is, you know, like I can be more rational right now. It's odd, isn't it? I'm not up there. But when I'm there, I'm in that moment. You know, and I, I had to go through some pretty horrible things. You know, I got attacked. I had five years of going through HIV treatment. All sorts of things happen in that journey. And they don't leave you. You don't, you don't, they take you on. But your scars are with you. When you think of them in the moment standing up there, of course they hurt you. They hurt me. They anger me, actually. But actually, emotion is real. And if you give me someone who shows me no emotion, do not have them on my team. Hmm. Okay. Uh, so many directions we could go in here. We'll just go with the moment. <laughs> it's, always, it's always a very powerful um, um, message when you see somebody who has succeeded mightily against the odds, uh, that they stand as a kind of symbol for... Of, of reward for effort, for courage, for, for breaking through, for persistence, and all of those other things that go to it. Uh, and, and the message, you too can achieve. You've just, you know, follow your passions. You've just got to have the dream and go for it and it'll be yours. But there are so many people who might have the passion and might have the dream and might even have the ability who aren't going to make it to the top, who, who, who will have to settle for second best for whatever reason. And that, that is a reality, isn't it? I think, I think your question is interesting, but I also think it's wrong. Um, so am I allowed to say that I sound like a politician, don't I? Um, and the reason why I say that is, is because it automatically assumes that's what everybody wants. And it's not what everybody wants. It's just what I wanted. And I think, you know, success does not have to be running a company Tell me how many CEOs you really know who look beaming with health and are really happy. Not probably as many as they'd like to think. So I think we should not always judge success in these categories. There are many different ways that people can feel they've been successful in their lives. For some, it's having a family. You know, I've got a guy over there, Mark Gardy, one of the most talented communications people in the country. I'm so privileged to have him on my team. Could he have been a CEO? Did he ever want to be a CEO? Prob probably or possibly, I don't know. But has he been successful? He's had an amazing career. I hope he still keeps having an amazing career <laughs> for a few years on. So don't, I don't think that's right, actually. I, I don't buy that theory about not everybody can well, be the successful. Well, the most obvious example of it, <laughs> I suppose, is the Hollywood dream, the number of young beautiful, talented people who head for Hollywood, about 5% of them who might make it and the rest end up as, as waiters. I mean, uh, I, I understand exactly what you're saying and I agree with you, but still the bottom line is, it's not, it's not that it's a dangerous message, but, but I think, what would, I think what there is a... What would you rather, Kerry? Oh, what, I'd say aim high. I'd say train. aim high. Yes. But no, I'd rather die trying, I yeah. tell you. I don't, I'd, I'm not going to sit there yeah. and wait. Yeah, okay, we'll move on. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Because I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure where the question was leading, anyway. But it's. <laughs> but I. But I do think that there is a truth behind it. Um, and a number of things. Uh, China. I want to talk about China for a minute. You mentioned that 
that you, you studied Chinese for three years and you speak Mandarin. Uh, and you are switched on to China. It's not just about learning a, la a language mm. and a culture from afar. So you've had previous experience with China uh, when you went to Blackmoors. Um, but what, what was the connect for you between Blackmoors and China? How did you see that and how did that unfold? Uh, as briefly as you can. China came into my life when actually I was about 12 years old. My entrepreneurial father lent some money to a Chinese guy who had a restaurant and lost some money in playing mahjong. So my dad ended up with half a restaurant. So we started eating Chinese on Sunday nights. And I think I fell in love with China then. And that's you know, why really I started first studying Chinese. Mm. But I'd actually worked in and out of Hong Kong several times for cable and wireless. So I actually was quite aware of it and I had traveled a lot with cable and wireless into China. And what was very evident was when I was sick, they don't get the doctor, they get the herbalist. So I could see this huge, um, you don't ever have to convince a Chinese person on the benefits of Chinese medicine. No. Or many Indian people actually, but you do here in Australia. so. It was clear there was a massive opportunity, growing middle class. It, you know, it wasn't such an intelligent. So you went over there and discovered that, that they had a bond store, a, a big a, a warehouse, clearing house in, in a, a free trade zone. Well, actually, when we first went into China, we went the hard way through the retail market because the free trade zones opened in 2014. And actually, just as we hired about 80 people and put Marcus's cash in it and created a company, the Chinese changed the rules and closed all the borders and sales stopped overnight, became illegal to sell anything, but you still got this massive bill. All these people need to be paid. Um, and at that moment, you know, it had been easy to walk away from China because it was a really, really difficult time. But the opportunity was there. We just had to work out how to do it differently and then, you know, something happened, actually right here in Brisbane. Do you want to know? Mm. <laughs> no, no, we could leave it there. I can, <laughs> I can tell that Kerry is incredibly, you know, incredibly sensible. So, 2014, Brisbane hosted G20. And I was very lucky enough, you know, Blackmores was not G20. But one thing or another, I got myself a gig at the, um, the party, and I knew Xi Jinping was coming. And I told my team, you know, I might have the chance to meet Xi Jinping. So they said, if you get a photo, Christine, with Xi Jinping, we will double our target in a year. Well, we just had this really rough time in China. I was like, I'm going to get a photo. So I get, we were staying here in this hotel, when we get to the event, they take your phone off you and all your cameras. And I had this straight dress on, but somehow, I don't know how it happened, my phone slipped out of my handbag and into this little <laughs> pocket. No idea how it ended up there. And then I spotted Margie Abbott, and I went up to Margie and said, Margie, I need your help. You know, I'm just trying to sell a few vitamins. <laughs> <laughs> These guys, you know, Andrew McKenzie, they've got loads of money. I need a photograph of Xi Jinping. She said, you don't stand a chance, Christine. You, um, you know, you've, um, you've got to, um, no photographs allowed in it. It's like a private party, and it's quite often the case with government people. Earlier that day, though, I'd been to see a Chinese fortune teller, and he told me to wear a piece of green. And he said, if I wear a piece of green, good fortune will come, and the photograph will happen. So I had a green necklace around my neck. And, you know, believe it or not, Xi Jinping came in the room. He gets surrounded. Alan Joyce is with me. He said, there you go. You don't stand a chance. And then Tony Abbott put up his hand and said, Christine, come and meet Xi Jinping. I tell you, I grabbed Alan Joyce's hand, ran over, and he said, I'm sorry, Mr. President. She would like a photograph with you. And we had the photo. That year, we had $750,000 of sale. By the end of June, we had 50 million, and last year we did 500 million. Every single day at Blackmores from that day, I wore that necklace, 
and when I got married, my mother stitched it in my wedding dress. So you can work it out. There's the China strategy, wear a piece of green. This, <laughs> this. <laughs> You've got no idea, no idea how many Australian <laughs> business leaders are now going to be desperately trying <laughs> to get a photograph with Xi Jinping. <laughs> anyway. Um, You've, uh, I'd like you to tell me the story that I heard you tell in another forum about one of your employees. You had a, you had a, a, a company, a competition for ideas. And, uh, and there was a particular person who came, he was late mm. in his application. Uh, and because he was late in his application, even though the idea was fantastic, you had to explain to him that he, was, uh, he wasn't, wasn't a valid entry and so he couldn't do it. Tell me the story. Tell me what happened with him, what his idea was and what happened. Do you know the guy who wrote Good to Great, Jim Collins? Does anybody know Jim Collins, Good to Great? Anybody ever been in sales? It's like the Bible of sales, this guy. Anyway, so lo that bit's long. Jim Collins coming to Australia, some, uh, somebody cancels and he calls me. I'd been arguing with him for a couple of years about him coming to talk at my company. And he calls me and says, Christine, I'm coming next week, Tuesday. A CEO in Australia has paid for a private dining room. You can bring a couple of people and you can have it because it's all paid for and he's cancelled. So you can just have it. So keep arguing, everybody. And um, so I call up Marcus and I said, guess what, Jim Collins is coming. I'm going to have this thing. And he says, fantastic. So who are the executive team? We're only allowed to take three people. And I said, only problem is, Marcus, I'm going to America. I can't cancel now, so you'll have to go and meet Jim Collins. And we should take a couple of employees. And he said, who are you going to take on your executive team? I said, executive team? I don't believe in hierarchy. I said, no, 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 no. I'm going to write a note to the staff and say, we're doing pretty well at the moment, but we're not great. How could we be great? I could not believe it. So many people replied. On the Saturday morning, I was in the airport flying, about to fly to America, and one came in from a guy called Miko. Dear Christine, my name is Mohammed. Da, 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 da. You won't know me. I'm a casual on your night shift, but I have a master's degree in chemical engineering. He had a PhD in food and agriculture. And I believe the great idea is medicinal herbs, um, medicinal tea, medicinal herbal tea. Anyway, he sort of writes his note and then tells me how he came here as a refugee because he hasn't got a personal, he hasn't got a permanent job, he can't get a proper place to live, so they're living in a shelter. And his, he was Iranian and he did it because he wanted his wife to be able to have a life of freedom. And um, anyway, it was a very long note. So I wrote back and said, Miko, I'm in a hurry. You're not winning, you're late. <laughs> um, see me a week on Monday. Tell your wife you've got a job. I'll sort it, Christine. On the Monday morning, I come back into work, and this guy, all these Iranians are outside my office <laughs> waiting. <laughs> and all this food and stuff and this noise. And I, oh, hello. And they said, oh, you're going to give Miko a job. Anyway, Miko was convinced I was going to give him a permanent job on the, on the night shift. You know, it's like working on a production line. And I said, no, 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 no. You're going to run that project. I've had your qualifications checked out. Apparently, they're the real deal. Don't worry about whether we recognize them in Australia. I recognize them. You're going to run the medicinal tea project. So we had about 100. His salary went from 40,000 to about 110. And his family just started crying. And then... He bought me this most amazing gift. His wife carved it out of a piece of wood. And it said, I'd rather die standing up than live kneeling. Or something like that. It is somebody famous once said it. But I thought, wow, how emotive is that? He is now running a massive project. And it's just so wonderful to see. And I think it does remind you sometimes that creativity and great ideas can come from anywhere. And we never really know when we're walking into our office who we're passing. 
It comes back, doesn't it, to the woman who saw something in you that you didn't see in yourself, doesn't it? Recognising the possibility of so much potential in so many people. I hope so. <laughs> um, look, I think it's just probably... Looking, you know, looking for not what is just on offer, but what might be behind. Yeah, well, I think that's how you really get a difference, isn't it? Otherwise, you wouldn't really get a difference. Mm. It would just be the norm as everybody else. But, you know, these people... We've got another one now at Australia Post. The guy delivering my boxes is from Vietnam. But he stood it as an accountant. And he even did his qualifications here, but he's never been able to get a job. He started on Monday his first job in the finance team. I told him, go home, write, write your CV out. Put on the bottom, Christine's my reference. Let's see if the finance team listen. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to take an executive decision not to have questions from the audience. We started this Q&A a little bit late, and I'd like to, as efficiently as we can in five minutes, get some insights um, on Australia Post. Um, so you walk in there, you've done, you've done your work in advance to a degree, a lot more than maybe a lot of people might have in the sp from what you've said today. Um, what, what hits you in the eye as the fundamental challenges uh, about the culture of the place? Not, not just about, about how you, how you mm. deal with the disruption, but what was it that hit you about the culture that, that, that was right and that was wrong? I think the thing that surprised me in a pleasant surprise, really, really, really strongly, was just this passion of our frontline workers. You know, people like Mario, who've given their life in our organisation. And I did a survey, as I told you, a strategy survey. And I decided to open it up to the whole company. Because, you know, everybody's got a good idea. It doesn't matter where you work. Why should strategy just be for the boss? And um, what really, really really enthused me was just this like 99% of the people in the company believe that purpose was the reason why they came to work. You've got purpose, I tell you, if you've got purpose and passion, you can get through, you know, this massive decline of letters. We might have a few challenges to do it, but we can do it if we have that and that unites us. But equally, there were some things that disappointed me. And one of those was that historically, we had decided that we might create a separate business, a parcel business. And so one day, we, we had decided previously, we tell all these Australia Post people, like Mario, who wore red and white tops for all these years, that they were gonna be a parcels business because we'd bought Star Trek, and that was blue. And they were told to wear blue tops. And unbeknown to me, I had no idea that this had happened. I just thought it was ridiculous that we had blue going on and red going on and, and all these different brands. What did that say to our consumers? It was, when you knock on the door, the lady who answers has to feel really safe because you're coming to her front door. She really trusts the postie. Why was she going to trust the guy with the blue top? And so I felt there was, we'd lost sight of who the real customer was. Both at both ends, the person who, you know, is the sender and the person who's the receiver. But perhaps most importantly, we'd lost sight on the importance of culture. Because as I told you, Kerry, I went in my early days and went to a parcel centre, which was the home of blue, and thought, I'm going to get beaten up here because I want them to all go red and white, because I want us to be one brand and be proud of who we are. And who wouldn't want the word Australia in your name? Chinese would pay a fortune for it. So I got a chair, I stood on it in a canteen and said, okay, bring it on. <laughs> I want you all to be red and white, expecting them to um, punch me, to be honest. I was with one of our board directors in Perth and this big gruff guy gets up and I thought, here it is. And he said, you fucking beauty. I'm sorry for swearing. <laughs> Now, um, it, <laughs> you've, you've talked about the importance to you of knowing everybody in the business. And in this, in this business, you've got 30,000 posties and so on and so on. And uh, with Blackmore's um, 
in the text that would go out to shareholders, um, your phone number would be attached. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and you were quite open about wanting feedback. You, you welcomed responses. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure how you can do that with the 23 or 24 million shareholders that you've got with Australia Post. But how serious are you about that? And this is in the context we had uh, one of your old bosses, David Thodo, here some time ago when he was running Telstra. He might have just finished with Telstra. And he said that the big challenge he took on was that Telstra had stopped respecting its base, its customers. Mm. And yet to this day, I still find Telstra one of the most opaque corporations on the planet. Mm. It's, it, it is classic of the corporation which seems to have gone out of its way to remove itself from contact with people. So on the one hand, you've got You've got this interface via your, your post office stores, but then behind that, I mean, many of these are franchisees and they themselves will sometimes screw up their face and sort of look over their, mm. beckon over their shoulder at, at the company that runs them. So how serious are you about that? And, and, and is there an easy way you can explain how you embrace that challenge? Mm -hmm. I'm very serious about it. Um, as you know, Kerry, my first business card had none of my contact details on it. So I changed it and made sure they were on it in bold. And I even put my name and personal mobile on the customer complaints website um, because I, there was no name or phone number for people to call after hours. And so I was challenging the team that if I'm prepared to do it, we have to give customers you know, somewhere to respond. You know, it, it was, um, you know, the day in January and of Australia Day, and it was on a Friday. Well, it meant we closed from Thursday to Monday. Hello, imagine if you've lost your passport, you, how frustrated would you be? You need to phone somebody, even if it's 24 million of you. And so even today on the website, you can get my name and phone number and um, address. And as I said to you earlier too, I've made sure my LinkedIn account is only run by me. So any employee in our organization can feel safe to write to me that it's not, you know, with the best respect to my communications team, it's not, you know, managed by them, not by my secretary, it's only managed by me. But and yes, it does mean very often I wake up to several hundred emails. How on earth do you deal with that? I, do you know what? I just do, because if, if I was a customer and I was so pissed off that I had to go to the CEO, I would want that CEO to see it. And it would only by, by listening to those customers can we fix the business. Otherwise, I'm protected. I'm told what they want me to hear. And I can tell you now, we get roughly a million complaints a year. If you look at those complaints, 75% of them have got to do with tracking. Don't put more, well, we need more customer service people in the short term, but it's not about having more customer complaints people. It's actually about getting tracking in our business and stop our customers feeling frustrated. And so I feel that for employees and our customers to be able to communicate and say honestly how they feel, whether they like you or not, I think is really important. And I will not change that. Christine Holgate, you've set a new bar uh, for these lunches, which is a big thing to say, but you have. Thank you very much Thank for joining you, us today. Thank you. Thank you.